So this month, people have been celebrating Star Trek's 50th anniversary. 50 years of going where no one has gone before, meeting strange aliens, and inevitably kicking the butts of anyone who gets in the way of the United Federation of Planets' mission of peace and exploration. But is it so peaceful? I mean, the kicking butts seems a little bit problematic in terms of being peaceful, but let's go further here. If you've seen the latest Star Trek film, Star Trek Beyond, then you're familiar with that movie's villain, Krall, who offers us this little bit to chew on. And you have committed an act of war against the Federation. Federation! Federation is an act of war. Could it be that the Enterprise's indeed the Federation's standing mandate to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, is somehow inherently violent? Besides butt-kicking, there are other ways to talk about violence, which, as Mike Rugnetta on PBS Idea Channel has discussed at length, can be basically described as the whole or partial negation of agency through force. So I think our buddy Crawl is onto something here, and I'm going to make a go at exposing two kinds of violence that seem to me to be fundamental to the Enterprise's continuing mission, at least as we have it in the many texts that have been offered to us. One is epistemic violence, and the other is, okay, well, yeah, it's butt kicking. To begin, we might ask, is exploration violent? Well, maybe, because even though the Enterprise is exploring outer space, that exploration doesn't occur in a vacuum. For one thing, the Enterprise is on a mission underwritten by a hegemonic entity, the Federation, a galactic superpower that signifies, constitutes, and reproduces order in the Alpha Quadrant. This order can be physical, sure, but it is also epistemic, meaning that it has the power to create and recreate a field of knowledge, the borders of which define what is knowable and whose discourses define how stuff can be known. As with any such episteme, the process of wielding that knowledge through language and signs, called discourse, creates and legitimates relations of power between people, entities, and other knowledges, and governs what can be communicated as true, or even possible. So what does that look like? Well, post-colonial theorists like Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak, in her essay Can the Subaltern Speak, use the idea to expose how colonial powers historically justified their interference with and oppression of native populations. Colonizers have deemed and arguably continue to deem the knowledges of native peoples as lower or lesser than that of the colonizers, scientifically and cognitively inferior or underdeveloped, or in any case, irreconcilably different. So Spivak points to how the British, encountering a polymorphous paradigm of Hindu law that simply did not fit within the binary vision of the colonizers, imposed a program of Western legal education. This program understood Hindu knowledges as in need of enrichment from Western scientific knowledges. The organization and reproduction of such knowledge acts and continues to act in concert with the accumulation of power. This sort of imposition endemic to the colonial project is a form of epistemic violence, that is, violence on the level of knowledge. But, you might say, in Star Trek, the Federation avoids such imposition by resorting to the Prime Directive. According to the Star Trek wiki, the Prime Directive, or Starfleet General Order 1, prohibits interference with the natural development of alien societies. But, you know, that one time Captain Picard mansplained it to Dr. Crusher puts it better than I ever could. Beverly, the Prime Directive is not just a set of rules. It is a philosophy, and a very correct one. History has proved again and again that whenever mankind interferes with a less developed civilization, no matter how well-intentioned that interference may be, the results are invariably disastrous. Essentially, the Prime Directive regulates the distribution of certain kinds of knowledge. Knowledge of science, knowledge of technology, knowledge of other planets and cultures, even awareness of the Federation itself. Captain. Did the indigenous life forms see you? No, Mr. Spock, they did not! The Prime Directive clearly states there can be no interference with the internal development of alien civilization. I know what it says! Which is why I'm running through the jungle, running in the skies! But as is clear in many cases, Starfleet officers' adherence to the Prime Directive is 
idiosyncratic at best and completely arbitrary at worst. Starfleet's ability to get away with choosing how, when, and where to regulate the distribution of knowledge is one intrinsically tied up with power. The directive's arbitrary exercise upon subaltern societies and individuals, that is, those who are understood to be outside of the episteme, can be and often is a form of epistemic violence. Even when things don't go wrong, the mission of the Enterprise is haunted by this potential for violence, as long as it is mandated to explore strange new worlds. Even if some of the characters explore from the seemingly innocent impulse to expand their horizons, that innocence is made problematic by the method of exploration, of appropriating those horizons under the dominant episteme. Is that epistemic method inevitably violent? Maybe that's debatable, but it's certainly not the only kind of violence the Federation is storing in its cargo bay. Assimilate this. Epistemic violence may be a nuanced affair, but Starfleet and even the Federation itself operate in an area of fundamental tension between the peaceful appropriation of knowledge and the use of force to maintain order and even to promote its interests abroad. Every Star Trek film involves a resort to some variation on military conflict, for which Starfleet, albeit the dramatic underdog, is nevertheless quite prepared. Star Trek Into Darkness was basically about secret super soldier and super warship programs coming to light. Without getting into spoilers, Star Trek Beyond is in part about the specter of the Federation's predecessor, United Earth Military Assault Command operations. Starfleet is itself the site of a military semiotics, with all the structures and signs and codes that belong to a military apparatus. Bearing the physical potential for violence, weapons, training, political prejudices, is fundamentally at odds with Starfleet's peaceful mission. When things go bad, when diplomacy fails and things go to fisticuffs, the Enterprise goes on defense and usually kicks butt. But the tension can't possibly hold for long anyway. It seems to me that it's only through ideology, the imaginary resolution of a real contradiction, that allows the Enterprise crew to believe that they haven't already created the conditions for their own embattlement. It seems to me that the Vulcans form a perfect metaphor for this dynamic, a dynamic of psychological repression. It's not that Vulcans don't feel emotion because they can't, but because they repress their emotions. Spock, a Vulcan Starfleet officer, embodies the result of subjecting the inherently unstable state of repression to the Federation's constant creation of the potential for violence. Inevitably, something will give way. You back away from You me. feel nothing! It must not even compute for you. You never loved her. Ultimately, the enforcement of political and scientific interests through force seems inextricable from the process of exploration. In order to keep the contradictory nature of the mission stitched closed, it must stay in perpetual motion. These are, after all, the continuing voyages of the Starship Enterprise. And for me, what makes Star Trek so interesting to watch is not the strange new worlds and new life and new civilizations per se, but rather the situations in which the contradictions embodied by the Federation, the Starfleet ideology, if you will, are forced into the light. When the crew of the Enterprise is faced with the violence of their mission, when they have to decide whether to examine themselves or to insist on maintaining their power to know, to declare unknown, and to make known. It's so simple. The Borg hurt you, and now you're going to hurt them back. In my century, we don't succumb to revenge. We have a more evolved sensibility. Bullsh! I saw the look on your face when you shot those Borg on the holodeck. You were almost enjoying it. How dare you? Oh, come on, Captain. You're not the first man to get a thrill from murdering someone. I see it all the time. Get out! Or what? You'll kill me? Like you killed Ensign Lynch? There was no way to save him. You didn't even try. Where was your involved sensibility then? I don't have time for this. Oh, hey, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt your little quest. Captain Ahab has to go hunt his whale.
that. You do have books in the 24th century. This is not about revenge. Liar! This is about saving the future of humanity! Jean-Luc, blow up the damn ship! No! No! Hey, thanks for watching. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the Prime Directive and Star Trek. What are some of your favorite episodes or films where the Prime Directive just like totally goes wrong? Um, let me know in the comments and uh, I've got sources and other links in the doobly-doo to check out. And if you enjoyed this video, now would be a great time to subscribe.